How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law, Thomas McCoy, and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Oh, I like that. I like I like the yeah, the way you faded that out. It was really lovely. You just brought yourself back from the microphone. Yeah. Well, you do what you do, you know? Yeah. You adapt, yeah. You adapt Dr. Joe, to uh, your environment. Wherever you are, you must adapt. Or things can happen, right? Things things can happen. Yes, you adapt. Yeah. You adapt. Yeah. You adapt and you evolve. You know, that's part of uh of how we've survived in evolution is the adaptation of who we are as a species and an individual. And it's happening all the time. It happens every moment. And yet it's still an I am. doesn't mean it's always going to get it right, but it's still the best you can do at any moment in time. Right. Tom, could you please introduce our guest for tonight? Okay. So tonight, Dr. Joe, we have Dr. Marissa Cleveland. With more than two decades in the education and publishing industries, Dr. Cleveland is adamant about supporting efforts towards the betterment of the human condition. She is the executive director for the Seymour Agency, a Hodges University Board of Trustees member, and a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author. In 2021, she was honored with a distinguished online teaching nomination for the Southern New Hampshire University. Welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Welcome, Marissa. It is a pleasure having you here. Uh, and... Um, we're talking about the new book that's coming out in November. Uh, there is no box, a practical guide for the relatable leader. I mean, it's just such a great concept. Mark and I were talking about this the other day, but, you know, more than just, you know, think out of the box. So what does this mean? There is no box. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so honored that you would have me here, and I'm, I'm really so happy just to be here and share the message about it. Um, the main part about There Is No Box is just that, you know, when you're in your 20s and you're starting out, or when you're in your childhood and you're starting out, they tell you to color inside the lines. And then when you get in your 20s and you start working in the workforce and they come up with, they want in, I, innovative ideas, and they're like, oh, just think outside the box. Give me any. But then when my husband and I were in our thirties, we realized like there, there is no box. Like there's no one way to do anything. And so that's kind of the concept behind the behind the book. And, and why now do you think, I mean, there's, there's been the box idea. Why now? Why do you, why are you giving us this great idea now? Um, I think it's always been there for us. We've, we've been studying leadership since we entered the workforce we've just been very interested in like our bosses and when people are like oh you know all the articles that come out and say people le leave bad leaders and so when we started studying leaders like just observing them and then going back to school and taking our organizational leadership degrees and talking with other leaders it just it kind of really hit us that you know it, things used to be a certain way but maybe and i'm not sure if it's because of like the pandemic or the way that the whole new generation coming up is looking for like that laptop lifestyle but mm -hmm. it just seems like everybody is figuring out what they can based on who they are and one of the really cool quotes that i love that's part of the book that he helped me conceptualize was it's not a a mile in my shoes it's a lifetime in my skin and if we use compassionate communication and apply that to everybody, then we just kind of understand that nobody is in a box. Like labels help you kind of figure out certain things, but they're not they're not the definition of who you are. And so so I think that's why I think society has just moved into this digital and global like landscape that that you can't fit somebody easily into a certain box like maybe you could back in the day of before the pandemic even so how does that connect with with the first chapter relatable leadership what what is relatable leadership 
Um, so relatability works in two ways. Um, for effective leaders, they are relating to others and they're relating to their circumstances. So relatable leadership is kind of a combination of like a bunch of other leadership theories that we studied um, where it it's looking at, you know, they understand, relatable leaders understand that there is no box. Um, everyone has their own journey to get their way to where they need to be. And those leaders actually want to help, help emerging leaders figure out their own path. And, you know, once we understood this concept of, you know, we're relating to other people, but we want other people to be able to relate to us. And because le leadership has like this influence with you know, or this relationship with how many people we can influence, the more people you can influence, the broader range of influence you can have. So the more relatable you are, that's that's like the common theme that we found throughout researching There Is No Boxes, that, you know, everybody, every leader that was most relatable and had a wide range of influence had huge, amazing experiences that helped broaden that range of influence for them. How do you do it? How do you become relatable? <laughs> so the book has five, what we broke it down after we did like some interviews and spoke with some people and went through some leadership development programs. And the book um, breaks it down into five ways that relatable leaders cultivate their relatability. So, and it starts off with like, they know their starting lines. Um, they increase their cultural agility. They practice compassionate communication. Uh, they embrace the leadership lifestyle, and they view leadership as uh, non-hierarchical. And so at the end of it, what we came up with was that the benefit of being relatable is the ease which, with, with which you move through the world. And so most of the leaders that we ended up speaking with, they were just like, well, you know, because they have all these experiences, they know where they come from. They know that their starting line may be different from someone else's. So they've you know, increase their cultural agility, they practice compassionate communication, they view leadership as non-hierarchical. Um, that's how we came up with relatable leadership is like, okay, so they're relatable because they do these five things. Huh. And, and it's, it seems different from the way leaders were perceived even 15, 20 years ago. I mean, there was that that sense of, of being more dominant, if, if that's a, is that a fair word to use, that leaders were somehow in charge of everything. And this, this sounds, this actually sounds a lot more pleasant, um, but is, is that part of the difference? I think that one of the main concepts that, that separates this relatable leadership from like, so, well, because it takes it takes on like inspiring, transformational. Like it does talk about the other leadership theories, but it's the fact that like everybody, the book is asking you to understand that you are the CEO of your life, and so it's it's based on the concept like that all leadership is based on self leadership, and so it's asking you to take on that responsibility of you are the CEO of your life, and so once you are aware of that and that you want to become a relatable leader or that the best people who understand they're the CEOs of their lives look at it like, okay, now if I'm the CEO of my life, who's on my team? Like who's on my team around me? How, how am I growing towards whatever I want to do? And so that, I think that's where it's, that stems from. Does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> I love the concept of, um, there is no box, right? Because we're always told go outside the box, but in your book, Marissa, you, you point out if you're outside the box, there's a chance you could look back at that box and you could see that box again and maybe get sucked into that box. But if there is no box to speak of, then you're free. It's, it's the freedom of it all. And I love the relatability piece of it. Do you, do you find that in order to be a relatable leader, you have to be very vulnerable? Hmm. Oh, that's, that's great. Actually. Um, I think, yes. <laughs> uh, something that we didn't actually get into the book, but that we started studying and are looking at doing an empirical study for my husband and I, uh, it's a, a generational thing where we, 
had met with some of the people that I used to teach when I taught high school. And it was really interesting because they were saying how, you know, they want to be happy and, you know, the things that they value now in their life as they enter the workforce. And they're, you know, they're late 20s, early, you know, 30s now. And they're like, we just want to be happy. We want to feel like we're making a difference. We want to work for a company whose, you know, leader we can get behind because we believe in their values and everything. But I think in trying to become the relatable leader, it's it's all based on like Kolb's experiential learning. So to become more relatable, you do need more experiences so that you can understand what other people are going through. And that in itself is asking somebody to be vulnerable because you need to get into a situation that you may not be comfortable with or enter conversations that may be uncomfortable to you at the time. But once you've done it, once you've had that experience or once you've been through you know, a, an uncomfortable conversation and you can see it, then you become more experienced in it. And then the next time you are faced with that similar situation, you are more relatable and other people can relate to you because you've also been through it. But I think opening up where you, you know, practice your cultural agility and you, you know, practice communicating with compassion, these things take vulnerability the first time out of the gate. And even, you know, it's an ongoing, Kolb's whole experiential learning thing is that it's an ongoing, learning is an ongoing process. And so, it's going to happen over time and it's continuous and and that's kind of how we feel about leadership and leadership development is that it's it's all over the place like it doesn't ever stop you're constantly learning how to lead and and learning from others and you're not always the leader in every situation so yes i definitely think it vulnerability is a key piece to it and to be authentic, right? I, I would imagine that a lot of leaders think that they're supposed to have this certain costume on that as a leader, I must speak this way and I must act that way. Um, absolutely. Like authentic leadership is one of the uh, cornerstones that, that we based relate, relatable leadership on. And the one of the things that we started discussing was the fact that in order to be authentic it has to something has to feel natural to you so you don't put on like one face when you're at work one face when you're at you know a baseball game and one face when you come home because once you've had all these experiences it kind of it becomes holistically part of you and so then however you behave wherever these decisions are always there for you um like a perfect example is the shopping cart test it's part of one of the sections that my husband noted about how like we sit in a parking lot and we can see the shopping cart and we can, there's no punishment. There's no law if you don't return it, but some people just take it upon themselves to return it to the crowd because they know they don't want maybe their car to be dinged or they don't want somebody else to not be able to park in that spot or they feel like it's a common courtesy. And so this is like a really great indicator that, that we like, I just love that example. So is this, is this something that young kids are, are natural born leaders or is this something that is taught to become a leader? Um, I think it can be both. Uh, one of the tenets that we say is that leadership can be taught and that's why we use compassion over empathy because like I'm not an empath, um, but I can have compassion. So uh, thank goodness and I hope this never happens. I have never broken my leg. So when somebody came to me and they're like, oh, I, I broke my leg. And everyone's like, oh, I feel so bad for you. And, and you know, it's like, if you have to have empathy. They broke their leg. And I just feel like if you take it one step further where it's like, okay, I feel terrible that you broke your leg. I don't, I can't empathize because thank goodness I haven't broken my leg, but how can I help you? What solutions can I do to make your life easier while you are, you know, dealing with your broken leg? And, and I mean, again, this sounds like a great message for people who are running companies, right? Rather than, than exploit, how do we get our workers, the people who are working with us, instead of just for us? And I think that, for me, that, that was, that's always been sort of my leadership style, is to make sure that people recognize how they are contributing to what we're trying to do. But that also means, though, that, that your leader has to have a vision for where they want to lead. Is, is that part of it as well? It is. Um, a huge part of the book is about, you know, coming up with, first of all, that you're the CEO of your own life, but that means that you also need to know, like, you know, the definition of success is different for everybody. 
And so if you know what success looks like for you, then how can you build your team around you to do that? And part of building your team around you are, are the people you spend your work day with. Because many of us spend, you know, a majority of our, a third or more of our work day or of our day with other people that, you know, we're using jobs to either pay the bills or, you know, whatever. And if we can do a job that we actually love, like one of the things is I don't have a job, I have a purpose, then that's, when we come out of it with that, then we are both the leader because it's non-hierarchical. But we are also, you know, helping everybody else who's under those leaders. Like relatable leadership is just about developing more relatable leaders. Yeah. I mean, certainly one of my definitions of success is when you love going to work and love going home. You know, because I, I really think that that, I mean, that's it. And part of it is because you feel valued in both places. I think that's part also of why this book was so appealing to me, because it fits right into this idea. How do we remind people of their value? And isn't that part of modeling real leadership? It's like, you know, it's, it's not just about me. It's really about us as a team. So where, where did, I'm still sort of trying to figure, the why now part, I mean, there's, there's such an applicability for this right now. Was that part of the design? Oh. I think, like, with everything in publishing, timing is a huge factor in something. So an idea can be percolating for a while, a proposal can be put together, um, and, you know, it, it takes back and forth, developmental edits, like, all these different levels. The concept, I think, has always been there for us, like, forever. Um, but, I mean, it, it did all start probably back in um, 2017 when I was sitting, I was sitting at a desk and I was looking out the window and I just, I really, I had already gotten sort of into publishing and I, I was working with the Seymour agency, but you know, I also was still doing a day job and my husband was like, you know, you're the CEO of your own life. If you don't like the direction you're doing or you wake up and you're not excited, he's like, well, then just change it. And I was like, oh, that, that can't be me. Because I used to be the girl who thought, like, I could never do it and, until I actually did it. And then I was like, oh, and if I can do it, I, I look at other people that are like, oh, I've always wanted to write a book. And I'm like, oh, awesome, let's do it. And like, oh, I couldn't. And I'm like, if I can do it, you can do it. And so that became, like, our, our why not concept of, like, why not can't you do it? And then the more we learned it, you know, we suddenly started following our own advice. And then I think... It just kind of naturally came into the, okay, well, if we're going to follow our advice, other people, you know, may want to follow our advice. And if this just helps one person become a better leader of their own self, then then I think that, that they, it, it all comes down to the fact that it was the right time, um, the right proposal. I, I do want to give a huge shout out to Matt Holt, who's the editor, because he started this line at Bella. And so he was starting this new line, and I was, oh, this guy, he was, you know, started this, this new line for nonfiction the leadership and I was reading the types of books he was you know coming out and I was like I just I want to be with that publisher that would be amazing and and you know so it all just kind of worked out so I think the the why now just is it's a lot about timing in this industry for at least from my perspective and also because I finished my my doctorate in 2020 um I started in 2017 in the fall then I I finished in 2020 and all that time we were doing work and we were doing interviews and reading, and, you know, just looking at different articles and kind of cultivating everything. And, and so is this has stemmed from your doctorate? Uh, it, most of it is from my husband's like lectures and his research studies and some of his um, academic articles. And then from the doctorate, from reading um, articles and everything, and then just starting to look at different leadership books. And I think the first one, in publishing, I was given the arc of, um, well, just a couple of different arcs, but I was given one of the John Maxwell books. And then I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, it's life changer. And then there's a section in the, in the book where I mention um, one of the YouTube videos that we end up watching in my doctorate. And then we had to, as part of an assignment, expand on that idea, like show how that was like a great concept, but it was also narrow. And, and then so we kind of expanded off of that as well. Like what we took, it, you know, we're fortunate that we've got these huge leadership giants that we can, you know, kind of base everything on. And then 
springboard from that, like, you know, the, the and, and then what about this? So. And, and what does Simon teach? What is he lecturing? Uh, he lectures at Georgetown in project management, leadership, ethical leadership, and at Johns Hopkins for uh, nonprofit project management and leadership. Yeah. And and we were off air. Um, I was asking Dr. Cleveland about the one of the first reflections, which is, um, I want to be a leader because I care about. And I was asking you, so how would you answer that? I want to be a leader because I care about. <laughs> what, what? How would you answer that? Well, I just have to say, like, Dr. John Mark, I think you do have a perfect audiobook voices if you did want to ever get into it. <laughs> I'm listening to it. I'm like, this is amazing. Um, so, yeah, that stems from, like, one of the parts of the book that talks about the prerequisites. Um, when we were talking with Dr. Meyer from Hodges University, where we were like, you know, what? why do you want to be a president of this, you know, regional institution and, and and we started looking at why people want to lead and why they even you know leadership kind of implies that you're going to have followers even if you're only leading yourself somebody's going to follow you but for followers and so the whole thing is what do you care about because whatever you care about is what's going to drive your passion and then your excitement and then people who also care about what you care about will want to follow you and find out well how can I do that how can I be like that how can I you know, also be part of this amazing process of whatever it is you care about. And so that's, that's what we're looking for. You want to be a leader because you care about, and you know, one of my, one of my favorite leaders is one of my closest friends and she doesn't have a traditional title. She just, she's, you know, a Girl Scout troop leader, but she has, you know, these children and she's constantly putting together these activities for them because she loves doing these things. And she's like, we're going to do this and this and this and this. And, you know, I'm like, you are an amazing leader because you, have this drive you have this passion to do these activities and then she's super organized with it and and it's like she just models exactly everything that you know i can see why they all just fall in line and follow her and you know even other people like they just hang on her every word like when she starts talking about what you know this is why we're going to do like this and everyone's like yeah and that's what it is it's you know what do you care about and then that's what you are going to find as your natural tendencies for leadership. Mine is book publishing. Like I love books. I love talking to other authors. Whenever someone says, uh, you know, uh, because authors are incredible. Whenever they're like, I've always wanted to write a book. And I'm always like, yeah, let's do it. And I think that's from the first time I told somebody I've always wanted to write a book. And it was like, yeah, let's do it. And like half the time I hear people like, oh, well, it's hard. And oh, the struggle and everything. It's like, oh, well, you know, that's the whole philosophy of, most parents are like, I'm going to make my life better so I can make my kids' life better. And, you know, so me, it's like, I'm in publishing now. I, I don't, I still don't know how I actually got in publishing. Like, I'm so fortunate. And so I want to help other people get there. So that's, that's how I answer it. I care about helping authors realize their literary realities. I'm going to actually pitch the question over to you as well as, as the leader of a company. But why, why did you want to be a leader? Huh. Um, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. Why did I want to be a leader or how did I fall into becoming a leader and how did I evolve as a leader? You know, the, the evolution as a leader is, is, you know, really interesting, but it, I enjoy watching the creation of other leaders. I enjoy the ability to help others become leaders and watch that flourish because that's what I get a charge out of. Watch them, you know, evolve and exit their comfort zone and do things that they didn't think they could. Like Marissa was saying, yeah, let's do that. You know, where they thought I can't do that. That's not in my box, if you will. Right. So let's move outside of that and let's, let's get, let's get comfortable getting uncomfortable. You yeah, know, that's, that's what I like most about it. Um, how I got there is a whole nother, another conversation. It's um, because I wasn't uh, someone who could be led necessarily, you know? So I went out on my own to lead, which I can be led now. But the idea was, you know, I didn't want to go work for somebody. And it was a very different era back then. 
you know, I didn't want to become the, um, the cog in the wheel, the employee, you know, I wanted to create something different. And I think I have, I think I was a little bit, uh, ahead of it when they, when we talk about EQ and relatability and vulnerability and working with versus for, um, that's what I enjoy. I mean, those are words that I use all the time. I mean, nobody works for me. They work with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoy watching people grow. That's, that's what I get a kick out of. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to come back for a moment to the book, actually for most of the show to the book. Um, just, just to remind, uh, our listeners, it's divided into these three parts, color inside the lines, which is sort of the, you know, what, what we're told to do as really little kids, you know, don't go outside the line. I actually wrote about this in, in, in one of the stories in, uh, in Unleashing the Power of Respect. And then thinking outside the box and then getting to part three, there is no box. In Think Outside the Box, you talked about starting lines, but you also talked about cultural agility. Can you tell me more about cultural agility, Marissa? Oh, um, yes. So this, this part is, um, it's a culture and, and there was, it, so trying to put everything that we researched and thought of into one, you know, simple chapter was uh, very difficult. So we didn't touch on a lot of it, but I mean, cultural is in every sense that you can define the term, including, you know, just everything kind of like any way that anyone would ever look at diversity in, in culture is how we entered into this thing. And part of it is that relatable leaders increase their cultural agility by seeking out experiences that they are not familiar with. And I think one of the examples in the book was I was talking with one of my friends and I eat pizza with a fork and a knife. I eat most things with a fork and a knife because I, even before the pandemic, I was a huge germaphobe and I carry wet naps and around with me everywhere. So she was like, oh, when I lived in Spain, that's how they ate their pizza. And then I was sitting in a restaurant in um, Naples, Florida, and then a woman came up to me and she was like, excuse me, is, is that because you're Asian that you're eating with a fork and knife? And I was like, no, <laughs> but thanks for asking. And I was like, I, I told her, I was, you know, because I'm a germaphobe and I did all the thing and whatever. And, you know, my friend was like, yeah, a lot of other cultures do this. And then I was like, oh. And then the there's a whole section um, on compassionate communication that my husband put into the book because he's a huge um, Malcolm Gladwell fan. And so I know it's under compassionate communication, but the whole thing he talks about um, an airplane crash and how, you know, mitigated speech shows like politeness. And if, you know, they had just understood, I think it was like, it, it was from another country. And so the way that they communicated was completely different from the way that the people in the air tower would be used to receiving that. And so, you know, a relatable leader who had a little bit more cultural agility would have already understood that this is the way that they communicate. And, um, and then also part of the cultural agility piece is just being able to move in and out of different circumstances and different, um, areas where you understand what you're walking into and you don't feel uncomfortable about it. Like I've gone with him to different like um, information technology symposiums and I am not an information technology person at all, but then, you know, I'm walking in there, but because I've been around him, I've read articles, I've been around other people who also took like their PhDs in information systems. I was able to like kind of move in and listen to the conversation and not, not like act like I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't act like I knew what I was doing, but I was comfortable being in that circumstance. And so the whole cultural agility piece is, you know, looking at other cultures and just being comfortable and understanding how they are. And I think one of the best things about that is like the travel vloggers now, these YouTubers that come out and they have these travel vlogs and they, they just go to like their, you know, country after country after country and they, they notice things and they talk about, you know, like, oh, this is new for this country. And then they're just becoming more familiar with it so that they don't feel uncomfortable where they are. And so that's the huge piece of cultural agility. And again, it's so applicable, not just to being the CEO of a company, but, but being your own CEO, as you say. I mean, we need this more than ever, the, the cultural agility. But it's, it's about, for me, it's about respect and value and curiosity and just wondering, wow, that's, that's so interesting. 
tell me about that. As opposed to, no, 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 that's not the way we do it, you know, which just creates these barriers. So it's, um, it's such an important life lesson. It's, that's what leadership is. I mean, is. Is it fair to say that in some ways we are all potential leaders? Or are we all leaders, but sometimes we just don't get it right? I think we are all leaders of ourselves. Uh, so we do say leadership is a choice, but I think we are all leaders of ourselves. Um, if, one aspect. So I'm, I did this um, leadership development program, and in it there was this opportunity to, to do uh, mental health first aid training. So I'm signed up to actually take that tomorrow. And part of the pre-lessons of that is, you know, it's life isn't, and Simon told me this like many, many years ago. He was like, life isn't something you have to do. Life is something you get to do. And so every day you wake up and you choose to live life, you are the CEO of your life because you're choosing life and you're choosing to be your own leadership. And I know that kind of goes into like a little dark aspect, but it's hugely personal to me. And so that whole concept that kind of filters into then becoming a relatable leader comes back to leadership is a choice. You're your own leader and you're choosing to be every time you, you get up. So, I mean, yeah, sometimes you may get it wrong, like you were mentioning, but I mean, as long as you keep showing up and you keep driving towards whatever you care about that day, then that's, that's you being a leader and you know, nothing, there's, there's not a golden rule out there that says as a leader, you have to be perfect all the time. So I think, just being a leader, even if you make missteps, you're still leading yourself somewhere. And then depending on how horrible or minor that misstep is, other people may be following you. Yeah, that's certainly true. And so we're, we're at that part now where part three, there is no box. And off air, you were saying that there's some complexity to this. Um, the project management mindset, values and visions, plotting with purpose and own your life. But you were saying the values and visions has has some, how did you describe it, that there's some complexity to it? Why don't we just jump right into that part then? Tell us about that, values and vision. Well, this was, this was a really fun part to go into because we also – um, asked like our friends and our other leaders and uh, our colleagues and everything to help help us kind of review and go over it because when we're looking at it we were like well if we're talking about the leadership lifestyle and that's where like you're holistically yourself wherever you are it's very authentic you go into one place you treat people the same as if you you know go into a grocery store as if you go home as if you're in a parking lot putting away a shopping cart with nobody watching you you just do it because it's just ingrained in you and so the whole like part of like trying to create your vision is, you know, what, what do you want your perfect world to look like? Like you can suddenly wake up and be that perfect relatable leader that you've always dreamed about being and doing everything. What is that vision to you? And the whole core of what that vision is, is based on our values. So if I wake up tomorrow and I want to have, you know, and I say like my vision of my, this isn't, but I say my vision of my perfect life is, you know, I have you know, curly hair that's always in place and my nails are perfectly manicured and long, then I know that part of my, my value is how I can present myself to the world at any given moment. And then if I say part of my value is that I want, you know, to be smart, be able to read and comprehend anything. Like there's a lot that I read that I don't comprehend. So say my vision is, you know, my perfect vision would be, I'd be able to do that. So I want to have you know, nice hair and be able to comprehend things. So then what are those two values? And then how can I put that into my vision? And so when you're looking at like, what do you really value? We ask, we have like a whole list in the book and then we ask you to kind of boil it down to like one or two things. Like what does just do you look like? And that was the hardest thing for us because it's like, you want to think that you value like all these things and because the more you value, you think it makes you a more holistic, better, well-rounded person. But really when you can narrow it down and that's where it becomes kind of heavy because then you're like making sacrifices. You're like, okay, well, if I give up this, I can keep this. If I give, and you know, and I just kind of focus on love and knowledge. I'm like, if it doesn't bring love or joy to somebody and I'm not learning, then, then I don't want it to be part of my, my values and you know, my vision for the way that I'm living my life. 
but that's that's the fun part i think was like really drilling down because it gives you a chance to really think about yourself and look at like well if if love and knowledge are my values then then why am i taking time to go sit out there and you know run a mile a day because i i am not a runner and suddenly i'm i'm waking up and i'm trying to run in the morning because my husband went to dinner with a friend who said oh i signed up for a marathon and my husband's like yeah let's do it so now he's training so now i'm on a bike next to him or i'm running you know but this isn't part of my my love or knowledge and then so i have to figure out well how is it and it actually is because you know it's it's self-loving care for my body and trying to be healthy and it's knowledge because i'm learning so much more about about running and you know how how it affects your endorphins and what kind of foods to eat to help you be able to run and i know a mile doesn't seem that long to some people but to me it's like forever no and it's, it's how the biological domain influences us but, tom we have a comment uh, question uh, from facebook can you read that out from jay thomas yeah he says uh, what about cultural agility within our own country i am a northerner and my family is all from the south we seem unable to be nimble in our own country i mean i'd say that's especially true for within any country yeah what about that marissa in terms of leadership because this is i mean that's why the book is so timely because it's we have a country with multiple different leaders sometimes pulling us in different places so how do we apply this i, I think that's that's an excellent point um so i was adopted by white catholic new englanders um raised in new england and I moved down to Virginia and then to Florida, which I split my time there. And when I first entered the classroom in Florida, it was a huge cultural awakening. So part of that cultural agility for me was putting myself in experiences with people that weren't like me, weren't raised like me. Uh, I was, well, I grew up with people that weren't like, looked like me, but that didn't have the same values as me or, or have the same thought process as me. Like I thought that if I called home to talk to a parent, that they would be interested in what their child was missing in the classroom. So, you know, back in like 2008, maybe when I was in the classroom and when I called home it, for one particular instance, the parent was like, I already made it through high school and they hung up on me. They didn't care. They were like, Oh, it's, it's their turn now. And I was like, Oh, and so part of that cultural agility for me was learning how to relate to those parents who felt like they'd already been through high school they didn't have time they they made it or the the children that came from like a one parent household or you know didn't have a computer at home then i mean they used to stay in my or they didn't have food they used to stay in my classroom to get like a granola bar um so i think that's that's a really great point i'm seeing it now even within families some families that live up here who have families that live like out in california and you know, they have a very hard time relating to that other person. And I think if you can, it's not necessarily that you have to authentically believe what they believe, but if you can compassionately look at them from their understanding, like, oh, I understand why you feel that way, but you know yourself that you're the relatable leader. So you're not putting it on that. You're just like, I understand why you feel that way. And then that kind of helps get you through that moment like if we all just understand that everyone's doing the best that they can but that attitude has to come from somewhere and it usually comes from the leader it's not going to come from the other person who's being controversial or who can't relate so i think the very fact that you're asking about that is like perfect because it means it's sh you are showing the awareness of wanting to be relatable and increase your cultural agility so if you just sit there and you know that you know they're doing the best they can and you know oh they it, it's not like that old oh, bless your heart mentality, but it's like you know that they're they're there and that's where they're starting from or where they're coming from. Then that just helps. Yeah, and that is exactly the I am approach. You know? <laughs> I know I love your website. As soon as I clicked on it, I was like, oh my gosh, and this person is like gonna have me come on. Like uh, I appreciate my oxytocin levels just went up. Thank you. But, <laughs> but that is exactly and thanks for the question, Jay, because it's so timely. That's part of why we really wanted uh, to be able to showcase and highlight this book because it is applicable to more than just the workplace. That's what we need right now. We, we need to have awareness in our country because there's the potential for so much division and we, we know where that will lead us. 
paths will lead us to the same place every time. So, I mean, talk about a project management mindset. This is a big one. How do we, how do we bring our folks back together? And how do we find the leaders to do that? Even though we have different leaders who might not agree with each other, if we can understand why the person is doing what they're doing, then at least, at least we treat them with respect and value, and that leads to trust. So with, with that in mind, talking about the I am, because these four domains interconnect, your home, the biological, the social, the I see how I see myself, how I think other people see me. A small change in any one domain can have a big effect. You don't need to change everything. So Marissa, what small change can you recommend to our listeners based on the topic we're talking about tonight? Um, I, I would say wake up tomorrow and compliment yourself. And then if you catch yourself being negative, just don't believe everything you think. That's, that's the core message of the book. That's great. <laughs> I think. And, and can can we extend that? So there's that the whole self affirmation idea, complimenting yourself. Part of the leader is modeling that for others as well. Yes. That you see yourself as doing the best you can as well. If you don't like it, you can change it. And with that in mind, you get to the second truth of the I am. Everyone is interested in what you think or feel about them through their IC domain, which has an effect on their biological domain, because you know it feels different when you feel you're treated with respect or disrespect. This means you control no one, you influence everyone. You get to choose the kind of influence you want to be. Dr. Marissa Cleveland, what kind of influence do you want to be? I would like to be the type of influence where after people spend time with me, they leave with joy and hope that they can also have, that they just are excited for the future and that they love life. Well, I certainly feel in that. Tom, Mark, oh. what do you guys think? <laughs> you know? Feeling good. Yeah. Love and life. Mark, Mark <laughs> I, I'm curious, Mark, how, how might you apply this tomorrow to Styles Law? You know, it's 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 the relatability, right? So it's those starting lines that you talk about, Marissa, you know, where they're starting from, where they are, where they're coming to. You come to them versus, you know, try to bring you uh, to uh, try to bring them to you, right? So, um, you know, it's it's more of an awareness, right, Dr. Joe? So I think we're doing a lot of these um, things. But it's it, it reading Marissa's book um, prior to this it, it reinforces and it and it it shows we're doing a lot of the right things, but it's also reinforcing sharpen that saw, keep doing those things that allow growth and leadership and and um, you know rem reminding yourself that they're doing the best that they can at that moment in time and and help guide them to to be their best self, to be their most authentic best self. Marissa, how do we get the book? When's it coming out? Oh, um, pre-orders are available now. <laughs> so if you just Google it, um, it'll come up either on Ben Bella or Penguin Random House's website. Um, it's available at like all the indie bookstores, Targets, Walmarts. There's a bunch of different links. Oh, thanks for asking. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, people, I, I hope you guys can do that. We'll post those links on our website. Um, but yes, let's let's get this one out there. Let's pre-order. Let's get it in people's hands so that it's coming out. What date did you say? <laughs> Your birthday. Oh, yeah, November just, 8th. <laughs> November 8th. So folks, November 8th. Big time for a great read. Pre-order it. Let's get it on the bestseller list. And uh, let's uh, let's be leaders in this world. Let's do there it. There is no box. There is no no box. You can be that leader. Marissa, thank you so much for coming on the Dr. Joe show tonight. Truly appreciate it. Can't wait to see where the book is taking you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Marissa. George, we'll see you next week. Thank you.